do want to get started so we have time for questions from everyone. Mm -hmm. So Jenny, I will let you kick us all off. Fabulous. Um, well, good evening, everyone, officially, and welcome to the installment of the UT Southwestern Science Cafe. We think it's a pretty neat thing that we've started, and we're that you've joined us this evening. Um, as Corey said, I am Jenny King, and Corey Tobian is my other half affairs. And on behalf of our speakers this evening, we're so pleased you joined us online. Uh, we are doing this program every other Thursday. This this is our third. Our next will be June 11th. And we are hosting online conversations where scientists are going to take you on deep dives into fun and different topics related to something in our science toolkit. Our format is active. Our speakers are both UT Southwestern faculty members and our invited special guests. Upcoming programs are going to include the science of pandemic modeling and forecasting, the magic of sleep, turning on your immune system with immunotherapy, and we have several more in the works. So that we hope you'll visit our web, our event page at events.utsouthwestern.edu to learn more and get registered. And before I turn this over to Courtney to get us kicked off, I have a couple technical points. Um, as we've discussed already, kind of keep yourselves on mute while we're having our presentation and it just helps with audio quality. And if you do have questions, feel free to go ahead and type them into the chat feature. Our speakers are done. And uh, Corey Tovian, um, who I call the tech guru of this, will um, be helping with our Q&A. Tonight's speaker lineup is three times the charm, an insight into art, mindfulness, and healing. We're pleased to welcome New Jersey-based artist Dr. Robert Sagerman, whose work is featured on campus at UT Southwestern, Dr. Madhukar Trivedi mindfulness expert and director of the Center for Depression Research and Clinical Care in our Ronald Brain Institute. Some people call him a rock star, but we don't want to get too crazy with accolades. And then <laughs> UT Southwestern's art curator, who's very talented and may have the coolest job of all of us. Courtney, I want to turn it over to you to introduce yourself and get our cafe conversation started. Thank you, Jenny, and thanks to everybody so much for being here. Um, I'm Courtney Crothers, and I'm the art curator at UT Southwestern, where we have an extensive collection of uh, My background is in fine art and art history. Um, and at one point, I actually considered going to medical school. My mom is a, an OBGYN at UT Southwestern. Um, so this role is a really good fit for my interests and skills. And my responsibilities um, include managing and maintaining our existing collection, um, as well as identifying new artwork uh, to add to it and developing arts programming like this um, across our campus. So before I talk a little bit about a, our collection, I wanted to start this evening's first poll. Corey, can you um, run our first poll, please? So here's the question. Do you engage in a creative activity, either professionally or as a hobby? And just answer your, your top, most relevant answer. I love seeing this action. It's like they're vying. Here we go. So 47% painting, drawing, or other visual arts. That's excellent. And playing music, 20%. Fantastic. And we do have some, 7% uh, of the answers were not not really into art, but um, looking forward to um, learning this evening. So I'm, we're really glad you're here. Um, I'm going to start <clears throat> by sharing my screen so we can um, take a look at some highlights from our collection. Let's see if I can do this. Here we go. Okay. Can everyone see that? You can see it? Okay, great, great. Um, with a lot of individual donations, um, but it was really formalized in 2014 with the opening of Clements University Hospital and our president, Dr. Podolsky's commitment to featuring art in all of our new buildings. 
Uh, so I'm going to quickly flip through. Um, there we go. And you can see some highlights. This is the atrium at Clements University Hospital featuring, featuring a mobile by Spencer Finch. He is an internationally recognized artist. Uh, this is also at CUH, and on the right, you can see we're leading a tour um, of art enthusiasts looking at a painting by Dion Johnson. <clears throat> um, one of my priorities as an art curator is engaging Dallas's very robust art community, um, supporting local artists and galleries. Uh, at least half of our new art acquisitions are by local artists or they're available through local galleries. And um, one of our fabulous gallerists, Chris Worley, is joining us today. Chris represents the artist whose work you see on the screen, as well as Robert Sagerman, um, who's based in New Jersey, but uh, Chris takes care of him locally. And we are so grateful to Chris for being an amazing arts leader in Dallas. So another focus, um, as you can see, as I kind of flip through these quickly, um, is that we collect contemporary, brightly colored, and abstract artwork, which we feel appropriately reflects uh, UT Southwestern as an innovative academic medical center. And in many cases, individual works of art are chosen not only because they're incredible works of art, um, but also because <clears throat> they relate to our clinical mission. Um, this is definitely the case with Robert's work, which we're going to learn more about. Um, but it's also the case with others, such as this artist you see, Anna Bogatin Ott. Um, her beautiful works are created in sync with the rhythm of her breathing. Um, they become a, the product of a, a deeply focused meditative state. And so in the detail photo on the right-hand side of the screen, you can see that each of the horizontal bands of the painting is formed from a series of vertical brush strokes. And that's where she's syncing up her breathing to create this meditative experience. Another uh, Dallas artist, very talented, Zeke Williams. Um, he created this wonderful installation in our pediatrics waiting area up in Frisco last year. So as you visit UT Southwestern's clinics and hospital for medical care for you or for a loved one, uh, we hope that the art program offers an engaging distraction from whatever challenges you're experiencing. Um, we include wall labels for all of the original artwork to give you information about the artist and the piece that you're looking at. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen somehow if I can figure out. Um, um, I want to point out if you can see the back of my, my background and Corey's background. This is a work by uh, Tom Orr and Francis Bagley. They are Dallas-based artists. And the work is titled Forest of Light. It's a major installation in the rooftop garden in our newest clinical building on our main campus, West Campus Building 3. Um, that's the same building where you can see two really incredible paintings by Dr. Robert Sagerman in the main lobby. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Sagerman. He's one of my favorite artists. And in a few minutes, you'll understand why. Um, Robert, welcome. Uh, thank you so much, Courtney. I really wanna thank you for including me and uh, Corey Tovian also. Thank you too, and Jenny King, everybody at UTSW. Uh, thanks everybody for joining in too. And Chris Worley from Chris Worley Fine Arts in Dallas. Thank you about me and where my art started. Um, I am uh, a practitioner of what's known as color field painting. So that's uh, an all over uniform field type of painting. Um, I was attracted to that type of work from the beginning because there's a kind of dichotomy going on between the materiality of paint and the immateriality of this overall nothingness. There's no composition to color field painting. So it was that dichotomy that drew me to this particular kind of painting. And it wasn't long before I discovered that the same kind of interest was at work for medieval mystics. Uh, they also were trying to sort of spiritually and intellectually fathom that gap between the material and the immaterial for them it was the, the divine world. Uh, and I became really interested in medieval Jewish mystics who posited uh, 
a whole system, very intricate system of exegesis to try to understand what they saw as these 10 echelons that bridged the gap between the material and the immaterial. So for me as a painter, uh, very difficult subject matter and I needed to evolve a way of working that was suited to trying to access that material. So um, I, over time, developed a way of working that really worked for me. Uh, with that, I'll try to pull up some images. So we can see what's at work. I'm afraid we might have lost Robert. Oh, there he goes. Here? We can hear you now, Robert. Okay, great. So um, I was trying to develop a way of working with, that would really slow down the work process and become very contemplative, a kind of process where I could be an observer to what was happening, where I could be a sort of passive onlooker. Uh, and really watch as the painting sort of made themselves. Uh, that was the way that I could access the kind of um, insights that I was looking for into my subject matter. So this is a detail of a, of a large painting where you can see that I'm applying individual marks with a palette knife and just allowing them to build up over time. Uh, so it's a way of working where there's no real single stroke of genius. Every decision has the same weight. So ego is sort of set aside. Will. So that's gonna be kind of a theme of this talk and how it has to do with meditation. The whole issue of being an observer to what's happening is really crucial. And that really started me, with me in this way of painting from the beginning before I even gave a thought to meditation itself. So I'll just scroll through and show you some other images if I can. So there's a, that's a, a full view of a, of a piece. That's a UTSW piece actually. Um, so one thing that I discovered from working this way when I was more of an observer as I was describing, the possibilities would sort of emerge on their own and I could sort of just follow them and let the painting dictate what happened. So in this case, a gradation from top to bottom started happening, it's not really planned by me, but it's just from uh, being, being awake to possibility. Position uh, starting to exert itself with that flow of the mark making. Uh, here's one where the, the marks have different colors in each individual. That was something also that just sort of emerged spontaneously for me. Um, one thing that uh, I started to notice pretty quickly, um, I became really, as I said, engaged with studying these medieval Jewish mystics and their system. And what I started to see over and over again was I had this mental reflex to sort of borrow from their doctrines and try to arrive at understandings of what I was doing from their doctrine. And I started to notice over time that I just had this mental reflex that was constantly engaged to, to make meaning, to try to understand. And in time, it was the mental reflex itself that be, became the subject of my attention to observing. That was the first real instance where I was no longer just observing the painting in its unfolding. I was observing what was going on in my own minds at the same time. So uh, eventually I ended up pursuing a PhD in the study of Jewish mysticism. In particular, I studied a mystic named Abraham Abalafia, a 13th century mystic, who engaged a kind of counting practice. He, during meditation, had a very elaborate system where counting played a really important role. And I started counting too, eventually, in my practice. Uh, on the one hand, I, I would uh, title the paintings with the final um, tally of marks, and that would sort of 
clue the observer into that immaterial side of my work. Um, and on the other, it was a focusing vehicle for me also. I could concentrate on thing away. Um, eventually, though, I kind of, uh, these, by the way, are pages from the ledgers that I keep that accompany each painting. So I tally up the number of marks for each color and the time I spent. This is kind of an effort to make my work practice more encompassing and not just have it be limited to, you know, oil on canvas, have it be wider in scope for me and exert more of an effect on me. Um, one thing also I noticed over time with the counting, it, it became second nature to me. I would just sort of count uh, instinctively. Um, so there became a, what's kind of, what's called a, a meta awareness, you would call it. A, I would just sort of observe my activity of counting. So another element of observation going on, a kind of meta awareness, being aware of my own awareness while painting. So th things got very elaborate into my work and the kind of observation that was going on. Um, in time, also, uh, I started to rethink the whole material-immaterial dynamic and understand it more as mind-body dynamic. Because I was doing all of this observing, um, I was really becoming more and more aware of my body processes during work. And uh, one, one issue that became really prominent for me was breathing practice. So I, I could link up my breathing practice with my work practice uh, in a way that was really uh, very powerful for me. Um, there is actually, a, a, in Buddhism, is a meta pr a practice, a compassion practice that I could practice while working in time with my breathing. And it could really trigger almost a euphoric type of effect. Um, I had been an ad this breathing practice pretty much eliminated it. I'm, I'm quite convinced that it was that that did it for me. Um, also, I eventually was able to expand that sort of awareness practice to really be uh, in tune with all of the sort of uh, bodily stimuli that my body, that my mind is receiving while I'm working. It's all a completely enriching kind of practice to be able to see almost this sort of symphonic range of stimuli that are going on even in what's you know ostensibly a quiet moment of working so i found a really abiding way of uh understanding a mind body connection and opening a lot of creative possibilities through this observational approach um, and one thing it also causes that's, that's really useful, it causes a kind of subsiding of what you're buffeted by all the time in your regular consciousness, which is this cycle of aversion and attraction, wanting things and wanting to push away other things, this sort of endless dynamic. I was able to sort of silence that, which is a, a really enriching opportunity. So I think that pretty much is it for what I have to say. Uh, I, and I can turn it over now to Dr. Trivedi. And while we're waiting for Dr. Trivedi to start sharing his screen, um, thank you guys all for um, putting some questions in the box. Um, we definitely will um, address them as soon as we get through Dr. Trivedi's um, presentation. And I'm writing them down this week. So. Keep adding. Good, good evening, everyone. Am I, Corey, am I to start or? To... Yep, go ahead, Dr. Trevetti, mm -hmm. you're good to go. So good evening, everyone. Uh, and it was very exciting to hear Carolyn and others who are participating in the, in the longitudinal studies, D2K, et cetera. In order for us to understand <clears throat> really brain mechanisms with related to depression. So my expertise in my work is related to depression and understanding how brain function really is affected when somebody has depression, how can we use that understanding to decide what is the best treatments, and then more importantly, how can we use that to predict long-term course? 
Uh, and so well, you might ask, what am I doing talking about meditation, et cetera? And I think I'm going to uh, ask you guys, all of you to, I think, remember, I think, and a number of things that Robert mentioned, but this whole idea of meta-awareness that he described is something that is something I'll come back to and allude to. I think it is a very good model to start thinking about. But I, I think two or three things. One is uh, the, a lot of what we think, we feel, and what we do all ends up either affecting the brain, and you can actually train the brain to do different things that you were not doing by changing the way you think, feel, and move. And in, return, in turn, brain actually has a big impact on all of these things. So therefore, trying to see how best to use this neuroplasticity that the brain has to improve brain function is one of my major goals, both at, for those who have depression, bipolar disorder. But the majority of our work actually is now increasingly with teens before the onset of the illness so that we can learn to prevent it. Uh, I'm going to ask you all to do two very quick thought experiments, and then I'll come back to work through my presentation to highlight why those are important. So if you all can close your eyes for just a second and do not try to change the thoughts you have or speed them up, slow them down, become thoughtless, just close your eyes and observe the thoughts that you're experiencing. Wonderful, and I'll come back to that in a second. In the second experiment, very quickly again, think of the worst ever experience you've had in your life and just let it sink in for a few minutes. In both of these experiments, what really happens is different parts of the circuits in the brain are really functioning. So when you were relaxing and doing nothing, the brain is not dead or stopped. And so that process of continuous thinking during that time is what the default mode network in the brain does. And think of that now. Speed up, high speed so that that cannot stop. And that is what one of our patients with the depression experience. Similarly, when you were thinking about your sudden terrifying thought, I don't think most of you panicked and left this room because your frontal part of the brain was actually able to remind you that this is just a thought experiment, this is not really happening. A lot of our patients with anxiety, specifically significant panic, are unable to turn that on and therefore they're really at the mercy of this sudden experiences of fear. And a lot of this can actually be trained, obviously medications and psychotherapy have a role, but I think that this is where things like meditation come into play. Now, if I know how to turn, yes. So uh, <clears throat> what we really, a lot of people have talked about thought, mindfulness, et cetera, so I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail. You, you're really trying to become mindful so that you're not necessarily having to tremendously change your thoughts I think the two points that you people who are long-term <clears throat> uh, proponents and use mindfulness really do two things. One is they become aware of their thoughts as, as again, Robert so eloquently described what he does when he is painting, is you become much more aware of things, whether you then synchronize with your breathing or other activities, different, different practitioners use differently, but that is what you're doing. And in that moment-to-moment -moment awareness, you are actually becoming mindful of your presence so that you're living in the presence. What often we all do <clears throat> is we are so busy in our thinking, in our actions, in our planning, to be doing something for tomorrow, the next action, the next thing. So in the business of planning for tomorrow, we forget to live in the present. And often when we try to, we then worry about the past. So this is really an attempt at trying to become aware of the present. <coughs> There's uh, obviously uh, 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 driven by 
<clears throat> the, by the brain and those people who have long-term use of meditation clearly show improvements in parts of the brain circuits that are affected in mood and anxiety. So for example, the prefrontal cortex thickens in long-term practitioners of uh, meditation. The insula thickens. There is loss, less cortical thinning with aging in these areas if you have been meditating. Similar experiments have been done with cognition and cognitive uh, exercises. So there are many ways of improving plasticity, but this is really where there's significant data related to several aspects of brain structure as well as the function as seen through brain connectivity or even through EEG studies that looks at the connected, uh, connectedness across these regions. <clears throat> It does, as I mentioned repeatedly, it does improve your plasticity, improves. Therefore now capable of interacting with the environment much more strongly. Remember, uh, uh, there is this un unfortunate dichotomy in psychiatry, especially depression, anxiety, but all of psychiatry where, uh, and um, a lot of uh, patients ask me, but more importantly, a lot of people in the community ask me, is do medications work better than psychotherapy? Is it medication or psychotherapy or exercise? And the short answer is, in most chronic medical diseases, they do not have this kind of debate. All of the potential treatment options are available to a physician or a provider, except in psychiatry, we get into these battles. I think that meditation, exercise, etc., are all beginning to show significant effects on improving brain function and impacting depression and anxiety. I am going to show you very quickly a few studies just to confirm, to, to give you pictures of how <clears throat> these studies use of meditation that leads to improvements not only in brain structure but also in gene expression that <clears throat> is cons consonant with improvement in brain function. Uh, th there are studies that are as far back as 2005, so this is accumulating. Obviously, meditation has been used in the, long, in the, in the past for a long, long time. <clears throat> this is a study where people meditated for 40, 40 minutes a day and they were able to show uh, significant improvements in gray matter <coughs> following the use of meditation. I think these, there's... So now, Corey, you're gonna do the poll? I will go ahead and do your poll. So the question is, which activity is the most effective on alertness? Sleep, meditation, watching TV? Remember, I'm talking about meditation. <laughs> Dr. Turetti, don't give them the answer. <laughs> I was hoping that will sway people to answer, the, take the other two. <laughs> so not TV. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty good. Well, I think that this is, a, a, and apart from meditation and work related to meditation, Obviously, you are all right, but I think that <clears throat> sleep, adequate sleep and maintaining a good sleep-wake cycle is also actually associated with much better effective alertness the next day. And in fact, most <clears throat> studies have consistently shown that American adults as well as teens end up getting much less sleep <clears throat> in their 24-hour cycle they do end up actually messing with their circadian rhythm. And one of the biggest culprits is watching TV at night. And so if you have a lot of <coughs> uh, TV time before you go to bed, that does have a negative impact on your sleep and makes the alertness. Going back forward. Am I missing? This is not moving forward. Okay, so meditation that is better than sleep. Uh, college students were asked to either sleep, meditate, or watch TV. They were then tested on alertness by being asked to hit a button. So this is how you test this quickness in their responses. And those who were meditators as opposed to those who had picked sleep or watching TV, they actually perform better almost by 10%. And these are young, adults or, or <clears throat> very young adults, and their performance can be increased by 10%.
you can imagine for a lot of us actually it is <clears throat> much better for uh, using meditation similarly meditation has actually been shown to be of benefit and, uh, and robert very eloquently gave the example of his asthma people have shown benefit benefit for high blood pressure <clears throat> One more poll, research has shown meditation is more effective than morphine in treating pain. Is that really true? Well, <clears throat> I... Uh, I think this is very good. I, uh, true, the short answer is, I'll show you the results, but I think those who actually, all of, of you who rated it false, I'll come back to that in a second. I think there is uh, obviously, as with any other chronic medical condition, including for pain, none of these statements are 100% true, and therefore those who rated it false does apply to a group of people for whom <clears throat> just meditation for pain doesn't work. So meditation, at least in this study and out of Wake Forest, it showed reduction in pain more with meditation than with morphine. Uh, similarly, med and most importantly for my work, meditation does improve people's capacity to actually <clears throat> control their thoughts and even not even controlling their thoughts. What, what a lot of patients, we've done work with mindfulness-based uh, therapy also, a lot of people experience that they become more aware of their thoughts and their negative reactions to their thoughts are actually much better controlled. So it isn't that they necessarily can do try to stop the thoughts, but I think the responses to that, these negative thoughts are much better. <clears throat> and there, so, so bar, bar, bottom line, in terms of how to meditate, there are hundreds and millions of people doing different classes and different and I think if you are one of those people who watches a lot of TV at night, uh, and some, all of us, at least I have occasionally done that, you see a lot of these ads showing about many different ways. I think the way to think about it is whatever method you use, it is better to practice and continue it for a period of time before you decide a better or a different approach is, is really worthwhile. Uh, one of the most important is try to manage and experience breathing and that gives a little more sort of time space awareness for beginners at later points once you are a much more more masterful at your meditation that may or may not be as essential <clears throat> and uh, being aware again of your circum surroundings as well as your breathing is generally a very good starting point so I think that people may, again, as I mentioned, and 40 years back, just as, a histor uh, as just to put it in context, there's a guy in Dallas who actually started really proselytizing the whole idea of aerobic exercise, Dr. Ken Cooper, in the field of cardiology actually didn't have welcome him with open arms at that time. It has taken a long time now, aerobic exercise, nobody even questions whether it is important for health, heart health, and I think that this kind of approach for brain health and especially depression and anxiety I, is going to end up being much more common. And that is because medicine has a way of ultimately going round and round in how it really tries to approach treatments. Uh, but <clears throat> as I said, in 500 BC, they said eat this root and now they are saying eat this antibiotic. This antibiotic is artificial, eat the root. And on that note, I'll just give you one example of a recent study we published. There's a protein in the, in the, <clears throat> in the gut, the, the bacteria in the gut that produce a protein called IL-17. That is, and if that IL-17 enters the body through the gut, then it shows evidence of inflammation in the body. We just finished a, published a study where people in, with depression if they have elevated IL-17, then SSRIs like Prozac, Zoloft do not work. Clearly indicating, and that IL-17 is manufactured only in the gut. So again, nutrition may be the next thing we'll study better in addition to meditation. I am going to stop here.
and see if there are any questions. Dr. Trevetti, that was great. Courtney, are you, um, I think, having a little bit of problem on yours, or are you still there? Wait and see. Okay. Well, I think um, Courtney is having um, a little bit of issue getting in. Um, we are going to go ahead and start with the Q&A. Um, Dr. Shagerman, Courtney, Dr. Trevetti, thank you. That was amazing to listen to. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask the first question um, because I think this is a lot of what people are wondering. But um, one of the things we want to know is, do you guys have any advice for people who are looking for different mindfulness activities or art activities, um, especially for kids who are kind of stuck at home during this um, unfortunate pandemic time? So um, I throw that out to both you, Dr. Shaverman and Dr. Um, Trevetti for any response. Hmm. Uh, well, I guess I would say first uh, on, on both scores, uh, mindfulness activity and art activity, I would say the number one pitfall would be self-recrimination or self-critique. So whatever you are inclined to embark on, if you can do it without that sort of uh, inner critical voice that usually stands in the way of being open to what's happening, then you will be on your way to doing something that you can feel good about. So that's a very vague, um, but hopefully helpful starting point. Dr. Trevetti, anything you wanted to add to that? I think, the, uh, I think part of it is this, the, as you saw even in the responses, the the breadth and the nature of activities that allow people to become mindful and, and especially art as well as other things, even gardening was used as an example. So, so scared that teenagers will get into trouble that we do not actually allow them to experiment with things that are actually in the service of improving their brain health. So a little more experimenting, that doesn't mean you take, allow them to take extraordinary risks, but I think the examples that uh, Robert mentioned, I think they should be allowed to and encouraged to get involved with, <coughs> uh, with uh, art, art activities as much as possible. Well, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and start calling on people. Um, so when I call on you, um, please feel free to unmute yourself, turn your video on, and e please ask Dr. Sagerman and Dr. Trevetti um, your questions. So I'm going to start with Stacy Miller. You had had a question earlier about some of Dr. Sagerman's work. Hi. Uh, we were wondering how um, long it takes him to do each painting. On average. On average. Uh, well, they're, they're uh, all different sizes. So um, a, a large painting, maybe a, a 60 inch painting could take, um, could take six months or a year. Um, a small painting, usually three or four months. Um, usually I'm working on a, a number of things at, at the same time. I may work at on five or 10 or more paintings and move from one to the other. As with uh, any, um, I, I think also meditative practice, if you're getting bogged down, there are a lot of options to uh, move on to. And the same with uh, creative activity, it helps a lot to go from one piece to the next uh, and let each one sort of percolate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we're going to move on to Grace. It looked like you had some questions about social emotional learning for Dr. Trevetti. Hi, um, I'm a high school science teacher at, at a magnet high school for students going into health professions. And before I ask my question, I just want to say um, I may be a little different from most science teachers, but I always leave a table set up in the back of my room with art supplies. You know, glue, paper, scissors, construction paper, crayons, colored pencils, markers, and it's always available for them. And um, I found that to be something that they really enjoy doing. Um, so, anyway, 
Uh, but my question was just, our school district has really been focusing on social emotional aspects of learning because uh, it's every bit as important as the academics just to have them be good people. And there's such an acad um, epidemic, not pandemic, epidemic of depression and anxiety in teenagers. And we have to be really careful how we approach it. But I would really like to know, Dr. Trevetti, how you would recommend introducing mindfulness and even some aspects of meditation into a high school classroom. Our classes are 90 minutes, and so it would be easy, I think, to work that into the school day. So, Grace, thank you very much. And first and foremost, uh, uh, teachers deserve uh, all, the, all the credit, and, and especially high school teachers, let me tell you, for my money, they should start paying high school teachers much more because that is a very high risk period for, for teens to start developing anxiety and depression. So I think, yeah, they should do better in maths, but let me tell you, the, their mental health at that point is really a big at risk. Going back to your to point about social emotional learning, we've now been in about 30 schools in the, in the Dallas Fort Worth area over the last two, three years, and we have introduced a, a different What goes on for social emotional learning in the United States, unfortunately, is not often, most often data driven. So to answer your question, I think that we got to actually first help the teens understand the language of mental health, depression, anxiety, social connectedness, et cetera. Give them the tools to learn how to do it and incorporate mindfulness and meditation during that process because otherwise all we are doing is giving them a few didactic lectures on you should avoid depression. Uh, and I think you can say that to every 30 year old, you should avoid hypertension, but if they don't change their diet and don't understand how to do the other kinds of things, exercise, et cetera, it's not gonna happen. And I, we, are, we are not giving them experiential programs. So it, there, are, there are others also, but our program is built on having experiential they have experience of the program we are doing. Our facilitators go into the school. Our sessions we do with them and the kids are involved in experience of how you deal with negative emotions. And during that point, we teach them about exercise, physical as well as meditation, etc. So that is how you have to, it can't be plucked in and dropped in on a day. It has to be part of their normal nomenclature and vocabulary. Great, thank you, Dr. Trinetti. Just one final thought about the school part. When we have tried to talk to schools about this, what I get back from school leadership and, and administration is our job is to educate people, kids. Our job is not to be doing this mental health thing. And what I have to remind them is that 10 to 20 years back, they used to say the same thing about kids' vision and their hearing. Then they recognized that in the absence of seeing and hearing, they can't learn. I think with mental health, it's the same thing. Really good point, Dr. Trevetti. Thank you. Um, and just um, a note, if we do not get to your question, um, we will um, be sending you a survey and some information tomorrow. So please feel free to respond back with your question if we do not get to it during the time. And we will make sure um, that we reach out to Dr. Trevetti and Dr. Sakerman to get response. Um, but moving on, um, Andrew, you had a question for Dr. Sagerman? Yeah, uh, Robert, I've always been fascinated by the uh, counting aspect of your work, and I was wondering if you used a uh, abacus or rosary beads or any other tools to help you in keeping track of such a large uh, count while you're painting. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, no, I, uh, I, I haven't uh, ever used that. Initially, I would uh, try to use a, a clicker while I work, but I found that uh, I would forget to click much more readily than I would forget to count. And at this point, it's so second nature to me. I actually become sort of a useful tool in the other way I was describing where I can sort of focus uh, attention on the mental activity of counting because it happens so automatically. So it's another route into that sort of self awareness practice, that's just another element to observe in what's happening uh, in the moment. 
So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty surprising what your brain can get used to doing over time. Thanks. Do you sometimes forget to count and if that happens, how does that, uh, does that change how you're feeling about it at that point? No, I, I, it doesn't happen, but uh, certainly uh, my, uh, my initial impetus for counting was more conceptual than it was, you know, uh, fixated on uh, ultimate accuracy. But I, it's so ingrained. I've actually tried in, in recent months, just as an experiment, I would, I would have a, a counter on my palette knife. So I didn't need to count anymore. And I really couldn't get myself to stop counting. So it's, uh, it's just so second nature that it's, yeah, like, as I say, I try to use it in a, as a tool in another way now, just as a, another element of what's happening. Thank you, Dr. Sagerman. Um, moving on to our next question, it looked like that um, Kanika, you had a question for Dr. Kennedy. Yes, uh, I was looking at the presentation and uh, uh, mentioning that the uh, meditative practice could lead to leads to alertness. I was wondering, basically, on the other hand, what are some of the other outcomes? Uh, sometimes, when I've done a longer uh, meditative practice, I may actually feel like I'm more relaxed or even feeling more tired rather than alert. So I was wondering, what are the arrays of outcomes from meditation? Thank you. Thank you for the question. And I think that is a, that's a really a, uh, something important to think about with these kinds of quote unquote uh, sort of willing activities, either physical activity or, so the same thing happens with following a rigorous bout of physical activity, aerobic exercise, etc. Same thing with meditation. So the alertness does not mean that it means you are kind of agitated. It is much more soft, mindful, relaxed attention. So your capacity to pay attention to the task at hand or the conversation at hand is much better. Doesn't mean you are agitated. So you can both be relaxed and have better attention. That is what actually these studies show. Thank you, Dr. Trivedi. Um, and it looks like, Penny, you had a question for Dr. Saderman. Let's see if Penny is still on. All right, moving on. It looked like, Monica, you had a question for Dr. Trivedi. Yes, hello everyone. I was curious if there's particular types of meditation that are more effective for certain uh, situations such as stress management, maybe improving attentiveness, concentration on tasks, and or alleviating pain. So short answer is nobody, you know, it is interesting. I'm glad you asked that because I'll give you my personal experience first and then I'll give you the answer. People, this, the whole idea of meditation and then mindfulness, and it's so related, uh, has really been often in the realm of kind of meta psychology and outside of the medical field. So it has not been studied as extensively. We've really studied it, and some others are studying it now. The NAV, NIH, and other uh, federal uh, sort of peer review organizations are beginning to get funded. So it's not been directly head to head compared. But coming back to my experience, there are, in general, if you look at and read the literature on those meditation practices that have been well described and in fact, even a little studied, there are two sort of divergent approaches people take. One meditation approach is they forcefully think about focusing all their attention on breathing and on reducing their thoughts so that they're trying to go towards fewer and fewer thoughts or no thoughts. And <clears throat> for some people that works, for me that doesn't ever work. When I sit to meditate, it actually is the very time that I get most thoughts in my head. So <clears throat> I have for, a long, for, for years now focused on a different type of meditation where all you're doing is not actually trying to control your thoughts, but you're observing and trying to learn how to not react to it. 
So therefore, you can continue to have the thoughts, but you're not really focusing or attending to that. And both meditation types have been described well. Again, as I mentioned, they're not head to head compared, but it may be eventually worth thinking about. To answer your question, with somebody with anxiety feel one way or the other, somebody with distress feel differently, somebody who, is, <clears throat> who has lack of interest feel differently, and that may be worth studying. Thank you, Dr. Trivedi. Um, on to our next question, it looks like Pamela, you had a question for Dr. Sagerman. Yes, um, I was wondering if you use straight oil or medium um, I well complicated answer. I I make my own oil paint uh, part partly because I use so much. I have to mm -hmm. I have to make it myself. So I start with uh, the raw pigment and oil, and I mill the paint myself uh, so I can get the kind of texture that I'm looking for because it's you know it's custom made by me. So um, so that. I pretty much don't use additives beyond beyond that. I can just thicken it in in process. And just a second follow up question: What do you find more relaxing, mixing your paints or actually the the process of applying them? <laughs> um, well, they're really different activities. It's an Finding the next color is uh, is uh, very um, engaging on multiple levels, as opposed to applying the paint, which is much more of a, a rhythmic, methodical, um, you know, observational kind of activity. So um, there are times where mixing the next color is really a pretty amazing experience, and there's actually a a meditation that I use at that time also that I, I didn't have a chance to talk about before, but uh, at times I'll find myself in a kind of impasse and I don't know what color to mix. And over time I've seen that if I am just sitting there and in the process of trying to get over this impasse, if I can just be an observer in that situation too, I can literally just sort of watch my hands go and arrive at a solution without having to willfully impose any sort of solution to the problem. So that's another, I think, another kind of meditation that's really interesting to watch in action. Thank you. That's a great question. So we have time for one final question um, before we conclude. And as I mentioned, if you did not get a chance to ask your question, um, please email into publicaffairs at utsouthwestern.edu. We'll also send that out to you as well. But for our last question, it looks like James, you had an interesting question about um, warriors and poetry. Well, yes, I'm often taken with the fact that the, uh, I had an opportunity to work with a Japanese company and they have the idea that a warrior uh, should also be a poet, should be an artist, should be capable with in various different medium. And I, I have always been taken with that. And I'm wondering how we could bring that cultural attitude into our environment. We'll throw that question to you, Dr. Toretti. <laughs> that is a, a, that's a sort of a, a society level question. I think at a, at a local level as, a, as parents or as school teachers, as, as Grace was talking about, I think trying to help the team understand that uh, that a broader perspective than just the math or just the <clears throat> uh, biology class is worthwhile pursuing is probably the starting point. But at the societal level, uh, I, I can I I'm, I I'm a researcher. I do what I know, but I don't know how to change society. Robert, any comments on making people more artistic? Hmm. Well, uh, I was I was struck by the the thought that the artist also needs to be a warrior. 
actually. <laughs> so I went another <laughs> another direction with it. Um, you know, as as in all uh, sort of contemplative practice, when uh, difficult things arise, it takes uh, a little fortitude to uh, to face them and and move through them. So that's what struck me. And and I, I as far as our education system, I. I'm over my skis on that one. I, I have no suggestions there, unfortunately. Well, thank you. Um, well, this has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you, Dr. Trevetti. Thank you, Dr. Sagerman and Courtney for just an amazing discussion around all of this. And thank you to all of our guests for joining us. Um, just a little privilege for myself. I actually started my career working for Dr. Trevetti at UT Southwestern. So it's been really fun to be able to do tonight's Science Cafe with him. Um, Jenny and I would like to invite all of you back for our next Science Cafe, which is going to be on Thursday, June 11th at 7 p.m. And it's going to feature cardiologist and risk optimization expert, Dr. Fawcett, who is going to talk about predicting the future and the science behind infectious disease modeling and forecasting, especially during the time of COVID. So check your emails. We'll send you registration link um, along with a brief survey about tonight's program. And as we close out tonight, we ask that everyone remember to please wear your masks, be safe. If you have any questions about COVID-19 in addition to the CDC and the local public health authority, please visit us at utsouthwestern.edu backslash COVID-19 for more information. And thank you again for joining us and we will see you on the 11th. So good night. Thanks, Corey and team. Great job. Oh my gosh, that was awesome. Terrific, everybody. That was great. Thank you, all. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Jenny. What a great team. Thanks, everyone. You guys have a great night. Nelly, come back next time. You get a four peat. <laughs> I will. <laughs> Bye, guys.